Uh, good morning. Um, today we're going to be reading uh, John chapter 1, verse uh, 43 to uh, 51. The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything come good? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked, come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here is a true Israelite in whom here there is nothing false. How do you know me, Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel, Jesus said. You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall be greater than that. He then added, I open the and the angels of God ascending and ascending on the Son of Man. Thank you, Eduardo. <laughs> What a great day. We've had lots of good things going on this week. Uh, if you were here for passing out the Thanksgiving meals, that was always a good thing. Very organized. Yeah. Great job yesterday. So it seemed like things went very smoothly. Uh, lots of good things that are happening. You saw happy people leaving, and, and they were glad to have the, the food that we had given them. And uh, so it was always a good time to be able to do that and to see our people working together so well. I mean, that's just always nice when you can, can see it, and it works great, and, and everything goes so well. So this time, you get to fix the turkey at home, I think, and you spend some time with your family. So get to relax, get to enjoy that. I hope you've got a couple days to be able to do that. So I want to talk to you today about gratitude and about what that means and what that's like. Hopefully you've got some. Thanks, Justin, for singing the songs and uh, that talk about our thankfulness and our gratitude toward God. And so... One of the things I was thankful for is having had surgery recently, uh, I got a number of cards that were saying, you know, we hope you get well and things like that. I got a very, a very special one. Excuse me, I can't get it out now. It's too big. From the village. So they sent me a card and I appreciate all the cards that I got. It's Village Del Sol, get well soon. I was so glad it didn't say what's really true. You're sick, you're miserable, your disgusting carcass is no longer required here. <laughs> Rather than that, they said, get well soon. That's much more encouraging. But there was lots of kids who signed it and things like that. So that's just an encouraging thing to see all the kids who, who sign it and say, get well. Uh, it looks like it's copied a little bit. And, of course, one of them put cat, bat, sat, rat. I think they're practicing spelling words or something like that. But, uh, but you know, whatever. It's, it's a good thing just to be able to recognize that... Uh, okay, that's not going to stand up. Just to be able to recognize that, you know, there's some good things that are going on. And so that's been a very good thing. I'm always amazed at when we recognize the blessings we have and a lot of times it's when somebody's house is just burned down and they are outside with the firemen and the news crew is there and they say I'm just thankful that no one was hurt but Jesus lost everything it gives us perspective and sometimes we need perspective before we can really be thankful and so I think that happens with us sometimes. It takes almost a disaster for us to find appreciation, to where we lose something that is extremely important before we can really realize that we appreciate it. Because we get caught up so many times in, in what's ongoing. I mean, tomorrow's Monday. Did you know that? Who knew Monday came after Sunday and we have to work again? We don't get the whole week off? 
Uh, but that's just an ongoing thing. It always happens. It always happens. It always happens. People want to eat every day. Why? That means we have to fix food every day. But we sometimes lose that. And in our hectic schedule, in our way of doing all those things, sometimes we forget. And we're not as thankful. We don't have as much gratitude because we're just trying to get done what we have to get done. And we don't realize it as much. And so it does take that perspective. So in a general sense, we should be grateful for everything, for air, water, food when you can get it. I'm thankful it isn't snowing and I don't have to shovel it. That's always a good one for being down here. Uh, so there's a lot of things to be grant thankful for, but I think we find this principle. Appreciation is not for what you have done, it's for who you are. Think about it, let's develop that a little bit. We don't appreciate the dishes. Whether they're having to be washed or whether they're full or need to be passed out, whatever it is. We do appreciate mom. By the way, you should appreciate mom because she's the one that fills the dishes, that puts the food on the table, that does all of those things. So appreciation is personal. It's not the fact that, oh, look, we have dishes. It's look at the food in the dishes no, it's look at the mom who put the food in the dishes. So get the right perspective of this. And I think that's an important thing for us. If we have impersonal appreciation, it's for better things. I'm thankful we have the dishes. I'm thankful we have the dishwasher so we don't have to go through and do all of those things. I'm thankful for sliced bread. I'm thankful for clothes dryers and clothes washers and all those things that we just take for granted. I'm, I'm thankful we had a car to get here in today. Uh, we didn't have to walk. I'm thankful for a lot of those things. And so but we forget all those because they're just kind of common, normal, ordinary. But if you brought someone from 1800 here today, they would just be so amazed at your life. How incredible it is. You mean you don't have to bake your own bread? You mean they slice it for you? I think you're spoiled. Goodness, who knew that? that they would even slice it for you. And, and so there's a whole lot of those things, I think, that we just take for granted. But what's personal is the one who does the clothes, the one who washes the dishes, the one who puts food in there. They're the ones that we care about. And someone thought of you enough to do that for you. And I think that's what happens. I saw this. It's not happy people who are thankful. It's thankful people who are happy. Sometimes we get that backwards. We keep saying, well, if I was happy, I'd be thankful. No, 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 other way around. When you learn to be thankful, then you may find greater happiness. But what happens if somebody's really not? And we all get there, don't we? By Friday morning when you're pushing through the lines on Black Friday at 4 a.m., you know, trying to get that one thing that you wanted and they just ran out. You're not thankful anymore for... Well, may, all of you may not have that experience. So what, is, what are we able to do to turn that around? I want you to look at a story with me that Jesus does. It is him dealing with Nathaniel. It says in verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee and he found Philip. And so when he finds Philip, he calls him, and he says, I want you to follow me. And so Philip decides, I need to let Nathaniel know, because Nathaniel's one of my good friends. We have found the Messiah, and for some reason, it doesn't give us details about why Philip believes all of this. Maybe it's just the fact that he saw Jesus, or something that Jesus did, or the way that he said it. But Philip believes all of this, and he goes to Nathaniel, who apparently they have had lots of discussions about this. And they have been searching scriptures, they know scriptures, they understand all this, and he says, come, I found the Messiah. I want you to come and meet him. And so he goes with him, he says, well, who is this? He says, well, it's Jesus of Nazareth, he's the son of Joseph. Okay, no, you're not sounding very good now, because Joseph is a carpenter, and so he's not a theologian, he's not a somebody who's high up, somebody who's really schooled in religion at all, he's 
He's the son of a carpenter. And besides that, he's from Nazareth. You know the prophecies. There's nobody coming out of Nazareth. There are no prophecies. It's Bethlehem. Everybody knows that. When Jesus was born, they researched it. They said, kings found in Bethlehem. Everybody knows that. And this Jesus, who you're talking about, is from Nazareth. No way. Not going to happen. Well, how do you do that? How do you convince somebody who is absolutely sure that God isn't real, that Jesus isn't Jesus? You do what Philip did. Come and see. Because as long as we're talking about theology and arguments, you're not going to get them there. It's when we start introducing them to a real person. And I think that's what makes all the difference for them. Is because Philip just says, you got to meet the guy. Come and see. And so as he's coming, so you've got a guy who is very, very critical, but a guy who's coming, all right, I'll come and I'll show you he's not right. You know, how do you deal with ungrateful people? I don't have any gratitude about this guy or any thankfulness for him because obviously I don't know that he's the Messiah at all. And so he comes to him and he starts coming and Jesus gives him the compliment. Here's an honest guy. <laughs> When's the last time somebody said that to you? Yeah, me either. I mean, we just don't say that. Especially when we don't know them and we've never met them. And so, you know, here's an honest guy. And, and he goes, okay, I'm coming to criticize you. I'm coming to tell you you're not who you claim to be. And you're calling me honest? See, Jesus is giving him a compliment even in his doubt. Because he says, I know at least you're honest. You say you don't believe, you don't believe. And at least you're being honest about it. Because you're not going to say something that you don't really think. And so he comes to him and he says, well, how do you know me? He says, oh, because I've seen you. What do you mean you've seen me? When did you see me? He says, well, I saw you under the fig tree. Before Philip ever came to you. Before Philip ever called you. So what's he really trying to say? That this is a, some kind of a psychic trick that, okay, I know where you were on a certain day. I don't think so. He's introducing him as a son of God. And he's saying, God knows who you are, Nathaniel. God knows everything about you. God has seen you. God knows how you've struggled with this. God knows how all of this has been so difficult for you. God knows that you sit under fig trees and you talk to him. God knows that you're a person who is very interested in God and you're trying to prove it and you would never follow anyone false. God has seen you. God knows you. And that just melts him. Really? Then he says, you've seen me? You know me? And that one thing changes it all. Then, gratitude. You're the king of Israel. You're the one we've been looking for. You're our hope. Because he's seen him, he knows him, it's personal. See, if it's only about stuff and about what you're supposed to do and what you got done, because after all, it was your chore, then it's not personal. And we have no appreciation for things like that. You only did what was expected of you. You only did what you had to do. But Jesus turns it around on him when he goes the second way and he says, I see you. I know who you are. I know you're an honest guy. I know all about this. There's no deceit in you. And God is taking a very personal interest in you. And I saw you before Philip ever called you. Why do you think I called Philip so he'd go get you? It's what God sees. It's what God knows. God knows how you are. Odd, he didn't say, and I know about your sin. He says, I know about your honesty. Interesting. He could have said that. 
I know all about your sin and about all the things you've ever done wrong. But he's trying to say, I want you to understand who I am. I'm the guy who sees how honest you are. I'm the guy who saw you give back the dollar where you had to go back to the store to give it to them and tell them they gave you the wrong change. I'm the person who sees your honesty. That's what God sees about you. And that changes his view of God. That changes his appreciation of it. God sees us. God knows us. And we don't look for blessings when we've already decided there are none. We write people off. I don't appreciate you. I don't appreciate things about you because, after all, nothing's coming out of there. How do you change that? Maybe it's when you know who they are. You make it personal when you get close with them. Sometimes we just don't understand all the details. Of course, Jesus was from Bethlehem. It's one of those important things to know. He just happened to live as Nazareth. And so he said, you know, is it just because I see you and because I know who you are now? He says, what if I saw you, you saw greater things than this? Oh, just wait. Your eyes haven't even been opened yet. What if you saw angels? What if you saw the Son of Man as a ladder up to heaven? What if you saw angels coming back and forth? What if you saw real messengers of God? Nathaniel, you're in for a big surprise. You're going to see greater things than this. Just because I see you, I know you, I see heavenly things. And they see you. And they know you. And they know exactly who you are. They know every time you've cheated. But Nathaniel, for you, they know every time you've been honest. And what that sacrifice took for you to be honest. What an incredible thing it is for us to realize that God has so much more to show us. And then he sees us, he knows us, he knows who we are. And that he cares about us. And he's given us those things. Does that fuel some appreciation? It's not just I got stuck here and I fought for everything I've got and I got my job. And who, who gave you the job, by the way? Who got the salary for you, by the way? Who got the house where you live? When you start thinking about it, all those things are blessings. All those things are some way in which God has touched your life because he's seen you. He knows you. He knows where you live. He knows what's in your heart. And he says, it's personal. I'm watching. It's personal. It's not just because, you know, you pray and I'll go, okay, well, let me see about this prayer. Uh, what is it that you're asking for? Uh, who is this guy anyway? No, when we pray, he already knows the whole background, the whole backstory of everything. He's like, I'm glad you're talking to me because I've been watching. And I've been watching everything of how you do it. It's incredible when we look at some of those things. We understand each other. We know how it all works. I saw this. Thanks, friend. You listen when I have a problem. You catch me when I'm about to fall. You bring so much joy into my life. Thanks for being a friend through it all. They're kind of mismatched, but aren't most friends. That's the way it is. We listen, we're there for someone because it is personal. I think with God, we believe we're anonymous. It's so nice to be anonymous on the internet, right? You can, you know, get on and you can make comments about things and except for there's that little bit fear in the back of your head that knows you're not anonymous. Because all that time when you were searching for something to buy for Christmas, all of a sudden that stuff starts popping up on your, on your screen and going, well, here's more just like that. And you're going, how do they know I was looking for that? Now, I'm not trying to compare the Internet to God in any way whatsoever, okay? But I'm, I'm just trying to say that sometimes we believe we're anonymous. We can say things, we can vent, we can rant, we can say the most horrible things because after all, I'm just saying it to my computer screen. No, everybody's seeing that. Pretty much. Do you want them to see that? Maybe you ought to be aware of what's going on there. 
Maybe you ought to be aware God's reading all that, and he knows who sent it. And he saw what you said. And not only that, he saw your heart when you said it. I think all of that, we like to be anonymous. We like to think we're anonymous with God. We never think God's talking to us. This is one of the arguments Nancy and I always have. It's, we'll be driving along, and for some reason, she will hear a horn, you know. And she says, what are they honking about? My first assumption is, it's not about me. I don't care if they're right behind me. It's not about me. And she's always looking around. Why are they honking at us? I never think it's about me. She always thinks it's about me. She's about 50-50. <laughs> but sometimes we think that about God. Is, you know, God's doing all these things. He's saying all these things. You're here already. And all these things are happening. We go, well, God never does anything. Really? Maybe we're the ones not paying attention. Or maybe we think we're anonymous to God and we can do all kinds of things and God never sees and God never knows. How do you praise from anonymous? Can you be anonymous and praise God? Can you be thankful to God and be anonymous? You know, somebody up there likes you. Somebody down here likes you. Is that the way we go with it? We have to declare a relationship or a belief before you can ever really be thankful or praise. You know, those songs that we sang, Thank You, Lord, were you serious? Were you not serious? Well, Justin's serious, so we're singing it for Justin, you know. At least Justin's thankful. You know, that's how it'll go, right? And so as long as Justin's thankful, well, that's the way it is. We just agree with Justin because he was leading the song. And I think we declare the relationship. Otherwise, it's praise God from anonymous. People say God is good. Which people? Who people? No, us. We've got to not be anonymous. We are the ones who make the difference. It's who we are. Practice appreciation, and it will transform your life. It does change. Because other people around you will not be the same. Because you're trying to see who they are. And they want you to see because they get overlooked so many times. And they tend to feel anonymous. But appreciation is to say, you're not anonymous. I know exactly who you are. I know exactly what you've been through. So the other option is it looks like Pharisees. Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so Jesus tells a parable about thanks. One man was justified in himself. He trusted himself that he was righteous. So the Pharisee's prayer comes out with, you know, I'm thankful that I'm not. I'm thankful that I'm not an extortioner. I'm thankful that I'm not unjust. I'm thankful that I'm not like the people over here because uh, we all know about them, you know. Huh. Oh, sorry, some of you guys are good. <laughs> but we tend to do that, don't we? We start saying, well, I know what that person did, and therefore the rest of their life is, it doesn't matter if they repented or changed or not. We don't like them because they're not people that are good. Well, I hate to tell you, but that's why we're all here. We've all been not good. And the reason we're here is because we've changed our life. Because God is seeing us, and he is working on us. So there's nobody here that's perfect. But what he does is he comes to us and he says, what I see is an honest person. 
I see an honest person who does not believe in me at all. Now, what kind of approach is that for God? Well, if that's what you need, he'll see that. But he'll also show you so much greater things. He says, I know every struggle that you've had. I know every tear that you've wept. I know exactly who you are. Unlike the Pharisee who says, God, I am so good. You must be so proud to have me here. I think that's what people think about church sometimes. You must be so proud to have all of us sitting here because don't we all look pretty? Well, all but the preacher. I mean, that's what happens, right? I look so good. I'm doing so well, and, and everything is so great and happy and wonderful. And the other person walks in and goes, I don't feel very much like I fit here. No, you fit just fine. Hopefully, we don't have that Pharisee kind of thankfulness. I'm thankful that I'm not awful. I'm thankful that I'm beautiful. I'm thankful that, and he gives his, you know, I fast twice a week. I give of my tithes. You did put something in the collection plate, right? Just, even if it was an attendance card, you did put something in the collection plate. Just checking. You know, because that's what he would do is, you know, I'm thankful for what I am and for what I have and for how I serve you, God, and for me keeping all the rules. And it's all about performance. It's about what I did or what I didn't do. And then you've got the tax collector, because the tax collector comes and he just looks down. He can't even really look up. He says, God, I know you see me. I know you've seen everything I've done. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm not trying to hide it. Because I know you see me. And every single thing that's gone wrong. And every time I have been ungrateful. And every word that I have said in anger. And every harsh thing that I have done against somebody else. I know that you see me. And the tax collector's been a guy who, he hasn't done very well. But when he comes before God, he's not anonymous. He knows God sees all the way through him, every single part of him. And Jesus says that man is going to be justified rather than the other. Rather than the other one who does not believe God sees what he doesn't say. God, I'm the guy who's great. I'm the guy who's not like them. Yeah, really? No. He sees all the time. He sees everything that we are. And when we think about that, it's kind of incredible to realize all of that. You see, when Jesus makes the statement, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, the Pharisee would take that statement and go, ah, there we go. We're going to prove that we love Jesus by the number of commandments that we keep. And the longer we keep them and the harder we keep them and the better we keep them, the better and more love and greater love that we have for him. That's false. I mean, yeah, Jesus made the statement, but that was not the interpretation of the statement at all. We measure the quantity and then we're done. Except for, you know, how many commandments and how much do you have to do? Well, you never end on that. It's always more and more and more obedience never ends. It's always more. And we turn into Pharisees who miss the point. He's saying, no, if it's personal to you, if you love me as a person, you will keep my commandments. The commandments are not done because of someone who has to follow. They're done because of appreciation. When you love and appreciate who God is, you will keep commandments. Otherwise, you find ways to get out of them. You see, the one thing that makes it all go away for the Pharisee, that he thinks he's kept it all, and more is better. More commandment keeping is always more love, right? Until you run into the widow who gives two mites. And more is not more. Because she has relationship. She understands I give all that I have. She understands surrender. And there's a whole lot more people like her in the Bible than that's what you see. We don't need to do more to be perfect. And the tax collector doesn't do that. And he also isn't anonymous. 
God knows. He just repents and asks for mercy. Did Jesus have to go to the mountain and pray all night? No. He goes because he needs God. Is appreciation commanded? I don't think so. But then God responds to us in the same way. It's only God's grace that could reach so low and lift so high. Because that's about relationship. So what do we do because of appreciation? And it applies to everything in your life. Appreciations and all the little things. I, I mean, get the big things, but if you get the big, you'll, if you do the little things, you all get the big things. So marriage is an appreciation for all the little things that happen. And it's hard to do that because you get lost in all that. I mean, we're rushing so fast and we're trying so hard. We have to teach kids how to appreciate. That's why I like the card. Because they're trying to do something. They're trying to, I know the teachers did it, but they're trying to teach them how to appreciate. And if you don't teach kids how to appreciate, they're going to grow up very ungrateful and have such a bad attitude about things and not be able to understand God. What I want you to understand is we can't say thanks for a cross, right? Jesus died on a cross. Thank you. Don't think so. Somehow that doesn't ring true, does it? It's just to holler out, thanks. Glad we don't have to now. We can't appreciate the one who died there. We can appreciate and honor and respect his gift. We can know that it was personal. We can allow it to make us better people. We can repent and humble ourselves because we know we needed it. We can make it personal as a response to God of thanks. And that's how you say thank you. But just hollering out the words, I'm not sure is going to do it. See, praise comes from way deep inside. So what do you need to do today to show appreciation for what God's done for you? Can we praise? Can we say thank you? Boy, it needs to come from a whole life, doesn't it? Yes, it needs to come out of your voice, but it needs to come from all the background of saying, God, I'd be nothing without you. God, thank you for your mercy today. Maybe today you're struggling with all of this and you don't feel like you've got that mercy and you feel like you're maybe the Pharisee, but I showed up at church, don't I get credit? You do. You were here. Now start acting like the tax collector and let's be honest. Because if Jesus really comes to you, can he say there's an honest person about his sin? about his shortcomings, about his failures, who comes to God and says, God, be merciful. Maybe that needs to be you today. Would you come while we stand and sing?